Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sure. Good. Good. Yeah, because I, I was thinking it was mainly Thailand, but actually this is more of a regional. Right. Yeah. Seminar. Right. Right. The time, the time is good for those who live in Asia, right? Yeah. And also, yeah. you know, Europeans, right? If this is not too early for them. Okay. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. So, I uh, shall we start? Okay. Right. So, uh, welcome to the webinar, yeah, hosted by Language Institute Thammasat University. And, you know, hopefully this is going to be the, the last one, uh, the last one for, for, you know, the summer break in Thailand, right? And thank you very much for all the audience around the world who have been joining us, okay? So may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Supung Tan King Sirin Sin, the Director of Language Institute to open the webinar and, you know, welcome Professor Norbert Schmidt. Okay, good afternoon from Bangkok, Thailand. So this is going to be a very short, uh, welcoming speech, okay? So I'd like to welcome all the participants you know, to this webinar organized by the Language Institute of Thammasat University. Uh, the theme of our webinar today involves the assessment of vocabulary for language learners. So this is a very important topic because, you know, to teach vocabulary more effectively and better understand its relation to comprehension, we need first to address how vocabulary knowledge and growth are assessed. In the ELT context, we have been teaching vocabulary a lot, but we may not really know how to assess or measure our students' vocabulary knowledge effectively enough. So today we have with us a very distinguished speaker from the University of Nottingham, Professor Norbert Schmidt, who is an expert in the field of vocabulary. So I believe that we will gain a lot of insight from his talk this afternoon. So let's get started and enjoy. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Supong, for a very nice introduction, right? So before we get started, let me uh, briefly introduce Professor Norbert Schmidt. Professor Norbert Schmidt is Professor of Applied Linguistics from University of Nottingham, uh, the United Kingdom. Professor Norbert Schmidt specializes in vocabulary teaching, learning, and testing. And, you know, uh, if you are doing research in vocabulary, everyone knows Professor Schmidt, right? He's, <laughs> he's been writing a lot of uh, articles published in, you know, very good journals, right? And he's an author of uh, books in vocabulary, for example, Vocabulary in Language Teaching, the second edition available this mm. year, uh, focus on vocabulary, bridging vocabulary, researching vocabulary, a vocabulary research manual. I also love this book. Right. And many <laughs> others. And he also an editor of an introduction to apply linguistics. OK, so the topic today, Professor Schmidt is going to give a talk on moving to the field of vocabulary assessment forward, the need for more rigorous tests, a, a development and validation. So we are going to have about uh, 45 to 60 minutes for Professor Schmidt's talk. Right. And after that, we are going to uh, have Q&A session, right? So if you want to share your comments or if you want to ask him anything, make sure that you know you drop a line in the Q&A box, right? Not, not in the chat box, right? So uh, we are going to try our best to entertain all the questions. And also uh, for those who are watching YouTube live, you can also you know, put your questions there in the YouTube chat box and our IT team will bring the questions here. So yeah, uh, we can get started. Thank you very much, Professor Norbert Schmidt. And welcome. Okay. Okay, thank you. Let me just, uh, well, hello to everyone. Hi, hi from Nottingham. So I really would have liked to be able to, you know, come to Bangkok, that would have been fun, but uh, everybody stay safe and hopefully we'll be able to travel again and be able to see each other face to face soon. Okay, let me start my PowerPoint here. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my PowerPoint. So what I'm gonna talk about, so I interested in all kinds of things in vocabulary. I started my PhD interested in acquisition. So how do second language learners learn vocabulary? And that's really interesting. That's probably still my main point. But what I found was if you're going to try to discover how many words people can learn, what methodologies are best, you actually have to measure vocabulary, right? 
because unless you can measure the gains, measure the growth, how do you know what people can learn? So it was almost an accident. I didn't start be, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to become a vocabulary test specialist. But I became you know, interested in testing simply because I had to measure the growth to look at acquisition. So anyway, um, became more and more interested in assessment. So my topic today is moving the field of vocabulary assessment forward, the need for more rigorous development and validation. Now, I'm going to be talking about it today. But if you want to look at this in more detail, if you go on my website, and I'll show you that at the end of my talk, the paper, which is published in Language Teaching, the full paper with all the details, much more details than I can give in my talk, will be there and then references and everything. So that's freely available. You'll be able to download that for free um, from my website. So anyway, you don't have to worry about taking so many notes or anything because all the detail and the information will be in that paper. Okay, so that's the topic. Why don't we get started? So here's a cartoon. I think it's nice to start. Does this look like some of your experience? Am I failing or is it the test? Well, sometimes the students are failing, but actually in many cases, the test is the problem. You know, there's a lot of tests out there, not just vocabulary tests, but all kinds of language tests that really aren't very good. There's also vocabulary tests. And it's just like maybe students have got a low score, but it might be that the test wasn't developed very well, or maybe the test wasn't appropriate for those students. So, you know, it well may be the test. So, yeah, as teachers and syllabus designers and government ministers, anybody interested in education, I think we really have to make sure that our assessments are good so that we have an accurate idea of what our students know and don't know so that we can help them learn. So testing is really important. It's not just something that, you know, a few people like in TOEFL should worry about. You know, every teacher has to think about assessment in one way or another. So like I say, I've been interested in vocabulary for a long time, since the early 1990s. And since I'm interested in vocabulary and learning, I have to be interested in measurements. So also interested in measurements since the early 1990s. Uh, probably my first real work with vocabulary was on the vocabulary levels test. So Paul Nation had the vocabulary levels test. It was his design. And he first put it out in like 1983. So at, in the 2000, like 1999, I went, no, it was earlier than that, maybe about 1994, I went to New Zealand and Paul kindly put me up at his house. So I stayed at his house and I had six weeks to work with him. So he was one of my early mentors. So I worked on revising his vocabulary levels test and basically completely rewrote it. And that came out in 2001. So that's the first of my like hands-on experience uh, with vocabulary testing. And then more recently in the mid 2000s, my, my PhD student, Benjamin Crammel from Austria, he, you know, he was a language tester. So he wrote, the university, no, the high school leaving exam for Austria. So this is a national exam. So he worked on that team. So he had a lot of testing expertise, but he was interested in vocabulary. So he came to me and he was my PhD student and we developed the vocabulary test. But I learned a lot. I think I learned more from him than he did from me because I knew a lot about vocabulary testing, but he taught me a lot about language testing in general. So anyway, um, I've been interested in vocabulary assessment for a while. And like I said, um, all this information I'm gonna talk about is available in this paper. And you can see it here on your screen. And I wrote it with Paul and Benjamin. So it's always nice to work as a team because if you just by yourself, you just have one perspective and one view, but it was really nice to work with Paul and Benjamin to bring their specialisms into place as well. So um, I think the paper at the very least should make you think, and hopefully uh, if you take the suggestions, you'll be able to make better vocabulary tests, right? So um, where to start? Everybody's making vocabulary tests. It's just like everyone's interested in vocabulary assessment, which is a good thing, I think. And there's a lot of tools now. So to make a test, you need to have a list of words. So a corpora, you know, concordancing tool. Somehow you got to find the words that you're going to test. 
And another thing is that, you know, nowadays with the internet, there's, you know, people can make tests, but then they can put them out into the world. So you got platforms designing, delivering tests, you know, on the internet, you know, there's just, you know, you, anybody can do this. And that it's a good thing in many ways, but I'm sure that it's maybe a bad thing in some ways because, you know, anybody can make a test and just put it out in the internet and then people like see it, teachers see it and they can use it. And, you know, we don't know if it's any good or not. So it's kind of an unregulated market, which, you know, can be good or bad. But what the result has been in, there's been a lot of vocabulary tests proliferation, both in journals and just out on the internet. So it seems like anybody can make a test. You know, anybody can get these corpus tools. Anybody can get a corpus. Anybody can just, you know, read one paper and, oh, this is how I make a test. And they can make it and then put it out on the internet. And, you know, nobody's stopping them. So anybody can make the test. But I don't think that means that they should. I think there's danger in that because unless somebody really understands testing, they can make tests that, you know, can be quite uh, misleading about student scores and that can have negative impacts on students. So not everybody, you know, it's not, I don't wanna be snobbish. I'm not saying, oh, only Norbert Schmidt can write tests. But what I'm saying is, you know, only people who actually understand testing, understand some of the, you know, the difficulties, the technicalities should write tests because as in everything, good test development requires expertise. You know, so most of the people out there listening probably are teachers, right? And, you know, there's the idea of like, oh, native speaker versus non-native speaker. And the old idea, hopefully it's an old idea that, you know, oh, if you're a native speaker, you're the best teacher because you're the expert. Well, we all know a lot of native speakers, you know, who can speak English, but don't have any idea about teaching. That's because teaching is expertise. Teaching is a skill. You can't just teach. You got to learn how to do it. You got to practice it. Well, test writing is the same way. You know, if you're going to be right, if you're going to write good tests, if you're going to develop good tests, you have to have understanding, you have to have expertise, you know, and you have to work at that. You have to learn it. So, you know, people should develop more expertise for writing tests or, you know, at least before they release them to the public. And just to give you an example of that, I recently examined a PhD thesis from a student who developed the collocation test. Now the student had a lot of testing knowledge. You know, she was a good language tester and she knew all about that, but she didn't really understand vocabulary. You know, she, she was making a vocabulary test in the same way she'd make a grammar test. Now a grammar test, something like, okay, let's say you're looking at, um, you know, plural S, right? So, you know, you've got, uh, boy, and if you want more than one boy, then you put S on the back, boys. Or if you got a uh, chair, you put the S on the end and you have chairs. Okay, so that's a rule. So if you have the noun, and so if you have a test and you have chair, make it plural, or if you have boy, make it plural. If you have two or three of those items, then, excuse me, if you have two or three of those items, and the students can put the S on, well, probably they, they can do that for almost any noun, right? So that's a system-based approach, but item-based vocabulary are, vocabularies are items, right? So just because you know one doesn't mean you know the other. So let's say, you know, fruit, you may know orange, the word orange in English, but does that mean that you know banana? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Does it mean you know the word kiwi? Does it mean that you know the word apple? Well, you know, just because you know one doesn't mean you know the other. So vocabulary is item-based. And so she was using a system-based approach to writing tests for vocabulary. And her test didn't have any specification about what the items were measuring. You know, here's a vocabulary test. Okay, and at the end, she got a number. Here's, you know, number like, okay, 50% correct. But what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of like, what can the students do with the vocabulary? Um, you know, are they proficient or not? So was their test really valid? You know, I don't think it was. So that was a case where, yes, she had a lot of testing expertise, but she just didn't really understand the nature of vocabulary. And so her test wasn't that great. So, and it could be, so she had good testing knowledge, but very little vocabulary specialist knowledge. 
and that was a problem. So that's no good. But the other way around could be the same. You know, you could have a vocabulary specialist who understands about corpus, who understands about, uh, you know, lemmas, understands about, you know, vocabulary acquisition, but maybe they don't really understand very much about testing. So that's not good either. So the opposite's also true. You know, so you really need both. You need general testing knowledge and you need vocabulary specialist knowledge in order to write a good vocabulary test. Okay. Um, so you got to develop this expertise. And most vocabulary test reports are showing that vocabulary-based surveys have been carried out. So, okay, they talk about vocabulary issues, and that's good. We need that. But you look at journal articles, and very few people writing vocabulary test articles talk very much about language testing literature. So, you know, I just think that there's a gap here. So we really need both. We need the language testing literature. So from a journal like language testing, but then we also need the vocabulary specialist the um, information or knowledge. And you get that from, for example, like a book like mine, Researching Vocabulary or books by Stuart Webb or Paul Nation. Okay, so what are some of the issues? So I'm saying you need expertise. What are some of the vocabulary specific issues that test developers need to engage with. What, what do they need to know? I'm saying that, you know, the vocabulary test developers need to have knowledge. Well, what is it? Okay. The first thing I want to talk about is testing purpose. Okay. Testing purpose. Um, and here's a question. Are one size fits all vocabulary tests viable anymore? Um, and what I mean by this is, this is the way that most vocabulary tests were. So like the vocabulary levels test that I made, um, you know, we made the test and like, here's your vocabulary size, but we never said, well, how to use it? Is it vocabulary for reading? Is it vocabulary for speaking? Is it vocabulary for EAP purposes? We never said anything about that. So if you write a test and you don't say what purpose it's for, then it's really for any purpose, right? It's one size fits all. And I don't think that that's, you know, viable anymore. So for me, what we need is a very clear indication of testing purpose. So we're measuring vocabulary knowledge. Okay, that's good. So it's a vocabulary test. But why are we testing? Yeah, what's the language purpose or use that we're going to use the information? Because why do you give a test? You give a test because you want to use that information to make decisions, right? Or to understand better. Well, what? we're all language teachers, I think, everybody here listening in, you're either language teachers or in curriculum development or something. Um, so you, you wanna have that information for a purpose. It's like, how do I develop the curriculum? How do I write a good textbook? How much vocabulary does my student know? What's their gap? You know, those are the kind of questions. So we have a purpose for testing or we should have a purpose. You're not like testing your students just to be mean, are you? I hope not. Um, so we're testing for a purpose. So nobody wants to interpret the te vocabulary test scores as just, oh, my students can get this many items on a test. <laughs> that doesn't do us any good. It's like, who cares what they get on the test? What we're interested in, what does it mean in the real world? So we want to know how that vocabulary knowledge relates to the ability to speak maybe ask questions, buy train tickets, uh, something like that. Or we wanna know how much, the, how the vocabulary knowledge the students have allow them to read the kind of things they wanna read. Or is it the kind of thing where, you know, do they have enough vocabulary that they can listen or they can listen to, maybe it's an EAP situation. Can they listen to a university lecture? Or is it the kind of thing where do they have enough vocabulary that they can actually write those vocabulary words when they're writing compositions. That's the kind of information we want. So vocabulary, we're testing because it's connected with the language purpose. And so what do the vocabulary scores mean? Here's the connection you want. So when you write a test or you use a test, you want that score to mean something about how well your students can use language. And I think that's a key thing that's missing in a lot of vocabulary tests because they never talk about it. They just say, here's the score, students know X words. Well, that doesn't help us at all. I mean, 
the test writers need to say this score means that you can maybe read a book and understand 95% of the information. Okay, now that means something. Teachers can use that. So I guess all what I've been talking about comes down to what I would call score interpretation. Every vocabulary test will give a number of some sort, percent of knowledge, percent of words known, or how many words known, or how many word family known, whatever. But score interpretation, what does the score mean? What does the number mean? That's what's important. So here's one of the key slides, I think, in the whole presentation. And this is a quote from the paper that I wrote and that you can download from my website. So one of the most important improvements we'd like to see in vocabulary testing is a better specification of purpose. So that's just what I was talking about. I think every test should say what the purpose of the test is for. But it's not just the purpose. You know, learners are different. I would think that you would want, you would want a different test for, say, um, uh, students, EAP students who want to use English to go to an English medium university. Well, that kind of student is different than maybe a young learner who's just in the first year or two of English, and you want to see how many words they're learning right at the beginning. Maybe so that they can just, you know, speak really simple daily conversation, you know, chat, so oral. So those, you know, those learners are different. So different learners might require a different tests or a different educational context, whether it's university admission or whether it's just a progress check for like maybe really very early young learners, beginning learners. Okay, so the point is the test has to match the situation. It has to match the purpose. The test has to match the learners you're interested in. The test has to match the educational context. And like I said before, almost all the vocabulary tests we've had up to now hasn't said anything about that. It's just one size fits all. And I just don't think that makes sense anymore. Okay, um, and you know, like I say, most of the vocabulary tests, or at least the, publish, the publications in the literature that talk about the test, support them, give really quite vague or multi-purpose explanations. So here's my test, the vocabulary levels test. Here's what we said. Vocabulary levels tests are designed to give an estimate of vocabulary size for second language learners of English, of general academic English. Huh. So general or academic. Actually, that's probably not a good thing because probably the test should have been like either for general English or for academic English. So, I mean, that shows a weakness of my test. Now, this is 2001. This was like earlier in my career. And considering that really the vocabulary levels test 2000, probably the earliest general vocabulary tests were about like 1995 or so. So it's still quite young. And so the vocabulary levels test in 2001 was like quite early in the development of vocabularies, vocabulary tests. So maybe for the time we, we did okay, but I wouldn't think that this um, statement of testing purpose would really be good enough anymore. I wouldn't be happy with it now. Um, I think it was good then, but times have moved on. We know more about vocabulary testing. So here's a test from 2007. The vocabulary size test was produced developed to produce a reliable, accurate, and comprehensive measure of a learner's vocabulary size from the first thousand to the 14,000. Again, it's just say, here's a vocabulary size, but it doesn't tell us, is it for reading? Is it for listening? Is it for EAP? Nothing about that. It's just, oh, here's a vocabulary size test. Use it however you want. Now, the good thing is that Paul Nation did think about it because I talked with him about this and he did put a more detailed description up on his website. And what they decided was that the vocabulary levels, the vocabulary size test was meant to be a test for reading. So, okay, now it's got a more specific purpose. And in his information he put on his website, he you know, gave the evidence and the information about how the test matches reading. Okay. Okay, so just to recap, a little bit of repetition is always good in vocabulary learning, right? So here's one of the punchlines. Vocabulary test developers need to clearly state the purpose, the learner, and the education environment the test is intended for, right? So basically that's what I've been saying. Okay, and then once you make that statement, you develop the test, 
then you need to make sure that the test works for those conditions. So that's what we call validation. So the, the number one is about specification. Okay, what's the test supposed to do, right? Okay, that's the purpose. What do we need it to do? What are the support, the scores supposed to show us? Then you make the test, so you, you do your best attempt. You know, no test is perfect, but you do the best you can and you make the test for that specification. But then step two is the one that not very many vocabulary tests have. Basically, validation is just checking. Does the test work? Does the test do what step one says it's supposed to do? Um, and this is where I think we need a lot more effort in validation, just making sure our tests are good. Validation equals, does the test work? Okay, everybody can understand that, that kind of definition of validation. So just to give you an example, so like I said, the, the original vocabulary levels test was um, Paul Nation's test, and he just wrote it in 1983, and he put it out in guidelines. I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but that was a RELC publication, I believe, and it was like a teacher's newsletter. So it's just a short little article. Here's a test. Basically, it's like, you know, okay, I made this test and, you know, see if it works. So there's one paragraph that mentions trialing and, you know, don't use it with romance speakers because of too many cognates. But that was it. So basically he, you know, but it was early. It was the first one. It really was the first vocabulary test. So, you know, good for him. It was a great effort. Um, but, you know, there wasn't any validation. Okay, the vocabulary levels test, when I revised it with my colleagues in 2001, we did do a validation test. We had one study, it was only one study. So we had 801 learners, different L1s, and we did different things. Um, and so we did show that the test worked, but the problem was we didn't say for what purpose. So we found that it did give a good estimate of vocabulary size, that's okay but we didn't ever say what the scores mean, you know? So if, if you got, if the student's got a score of 50% or 75%, is that good? Is that bad? Um, what does it allow the students to do? We never made that connection with the real life, um, you know, real life language use. So I think that's a problem. So again, that was 2001. And I guess in 2001, it was a good job. We did, you know, pretty well. It was an improvement on 1983. All I'm saying is now in 2020, that's not good enough anymore. Um, the oral X test. So this is a test that Jim Milton made. So he's from the University of Swansea. And he, it was basically a test of oral, of spoken vocabulary. And he showed, there was one study that showed the test is reliable and it correlated moderately with the XLEX test. So the XLEX test was the written text. The oral lex was the spoken text. Okay, but okay, do people have exactly the same written and spoken vocabulary? Would we expect those numbers to be the same? No, we wouldn't. Um, generally, people will know more vocabulary spoken, you know, because you learn it orally first than written, but for some students, maybe the other way around. So just because it correlates, the spoken test correlates with the written test, and it wasn't that strong anyway, um, doesn't mean that the test is valid. And because what the oral X test should have done is show that if the students were able to get the answer right on the oral X test, that they were able to use it in their speech or at least be able to understand it when they're listening. That's what they needed for validation, but there was nothing like that. So the point is, past tests really haven't had very good test validation. Vocabulary size test, 2007, there wasn't any validation informa information in the original study um, or the original article, but there's a follow-up study by Bagler in 2010, and that was a good paper. It was a good research article, but okay, it showed just little bits of validation. It showed a little bit of the test behavior and what it showed was okay, but you know, by itself, you know, it couldn't be everything. You know, you cannot validate a test with one study. So this particular study by Bagler, he did his study in Japan. That's where he lives and he works. And with those Japanese students, okay, it seemed to work okay. But let's say, could you use the vocabulary size test in Thailand or in Indonesia or the Philippines, where I know that some of you are listening to this uh, podcast. 
sounds like. We don't know because we don't have any evidence of whether the vocabulary size test works in those countries with those speakers of different L1s because you know, we just don't know. Japanese is not the same as all your different languages. So it might work, but it might not. So that's the problem with test validation. We need to show that the test works. Okay, so that's about validation. Let's move on to item format. Okay, so the format is just basic the shape, whether it's multiple choice or fill in the blank. So it's the actual kind of physical shape of the test item. Okay, some people you'll call them test questions. We typically say item because a lot of tests aren't actually questions, are they? You know, they might be matching or fill in the question, fill in the blanks. So we just say item format. So anyway, so um, we, you know, again, if you've got a purpose and you got your specification, what's the purpose, what the kind of students, and that can give you information about which kind of item format to use. Just don't take an item format just because, oh, you know, I'll just use this, somebody else use it, or we always use this before. No, pick the item format that actually gives the information you want. And there's no perfect, I can tell you right now, there's no perfect item format. I've been doing vocabulary testing for a long time. Every item format gives you a little different information, but every item format has problems. So how do you decide? Um, let's talk about multiple choice because they're probably the most common, yeah? So MC, that's just shorthand for multiple choice test. Okay, we've all seen them, you know, they're like on TOEFL tests, so many different kinds of tests. You've got the item and then you got usually four options, A, B, C, or D. One of the problems that I see with multiple choice tests is that students guess. But actually guessing isn't the right word there because students typically don't guess. They don't shut their eyes and just guess A, B, C, or D. They use test taking strategies and they're good at them. So they look for clues. Okay, uh, D doesn't seem very obvious. I'll throw D away. Now I've got a 33% chance, so A, B, or C. Or, you know, they can find grammatical clues or something. So multiple choice items are actually quite hard to write where they don't give any clues away. Um, and yeah, so students are actually good at these test taking strategies. How successful can they be? So let's say a four option A, B, C, D type test, 5%, 10%, 25%, 50%. Um, the answer is you don't really know. Some students can be better than others at test guessing, but you might guess that 25% would be the average chances on a four option because you could shut your eyes um, and just pick one of the four A, B, C, or D and you'd have 25% chance, chance of being right. Okay, but that's just sort of like what we would guess mathematically. We actually did a study. So this is a study. Again, it's available on my website. I'll show you that at the end of the talk where all of these papers are available for free download. And if you're like me, you like free, right? Okay. So this is a paper by my friend, Hendrik Gilstad. He works in Sweden. So he's a vocabulary testing specialist. Laura Velkaita, she's from Lithuania. She was one of my former PhD students and myself. So this was actually Laura's, originally it was her MA dissertation project. And then we invited Henrik to participate and he collected some Swedish data to go with Laura's data. And we put all the data together and we were able to publish this in ITL, International Journal of Bilinguistics. So what did we do? Now, again, we're interested in validation. Does the test work? Does the item format? So we're looking at the multiple choice item format. So I've got VST here because we actually took the items from the vocabulary size test. And we took them from the 3000 frequency level, 6000 frequency level and 9000 frequency level. And so what we did was we gave you know, the participants, the students from Lithuania, from the UK, from Sweden, we gave them the vocabulary size test items at the three, six and nine level. And we let them do them. Then we took the test away. We didn't look at it because we didn't want to know whether they got them yes or no. 
So as researchers, we weren't biased. So we took the test away, we didn't look at them, and then we interviewed the students on those same items. So let's say if we had the uh, word uh, candle. So the candle was on the test, A, B, C, or D, the students marked it. We took the test away. And in the interview, we said, okay, what does candle mean? And they could use their L1, they could give a definition, they could draw a picture, anything, just show us what the meaning is. Okay, and if we weren't sure, we could ask them more questions. So basically the interview gives us a very, very good idea of whether they knew the word candle or not. So we'll call the interview the reflection of their true knowledge because, okay, it's not exactly, we don't know for sure, but you can be pretty sure if you interview somebody whether they know the word or not. So the interview, you know, we could find out. So it was either they knew the word or they didn't know the word. So what we did is we matched it with what their uh, response was on the test. Okay, so what we want is this. So if the students knew it in the interview, then the best case is that they got it correct on the test, right? So that means the test reflected the true knowledge. Or if they missed it on the test, if it was incorrect on the test, then the interview should show that they didn't know it. So this is a case where the test is working. It shows their actual knowledge. And what do we see at the 3000 level? Okay, so if they knew it, 49% of the cases, the test was doing well. Or if they missed it, 30% of the cases, the test is doing well. That looks pretty good. Let's go to the 6,000 level. And again, you know, the figures are pretty good and the 9,000 level, eh, not as good, but still looks okay. So, so far, so good. The test seems to be doing okay. Now let's look at this case. So this is the case where they missed it on the test. The test was incorrect, but they actually knew the word. So here we have a case where the test is missing knowledge that the students have. The students actually knew the word, but the test is indicating that they don't know the word. So we might call that underestimation. The test is underreporting or underestimating their knowledge. The test is missing the knowledge the students actually know. But we see here, it's not really too much because you know multiple choice are like easier formats. You don't get very many cases where the students miss the item if they actually know it. So there's always a little bit of error. It's never zero error, but it's not really too much. It's like, you know, as a test writer, I'd be very happy with these scores. But here's for me the most important part, because in this case is the test was showing that the students knew the word, but the interview showed that they didn't really. So in other words, the test was giving extra points for free. It was overestimating the student's knowledge or overreporting it. Okay. And this is the problem because if the test is saying the students know this information, they're fine with it. And is the, you know, you're a teacher and you think, okay, the students know these words and it's okay. I don't have to teach them or I don't have to review them anymore. But if the students don't know it, then they're going to be missing that vocabulary. So this is the problem where students get more scores on the test than they have in the real life. So how does it work? Uh, at the 3,000, 18%, you know, more, it, more uh, scores than they should have got. At the 6,000, 13 and 13. But look at the 9,000. Almost a third uh, of the scores, you know, the students didn't know the word, but they got it right on the test. Now that's a lot, I think. Um, you might be asking why it's the difference. I think the main difference is at the 3000 level, students, you know, okay, that's higher frequency and students knew more of the words. So there were fewer words to guess at, but like at the 9000 level, this is getting to, you know, low frequency vocabulary. Students didn't know so many of these words. So there were a lot more words to guess at. And, you know, they were successful at guessing and, you know, 30%. So, the point here is, you know, what do these figures mean? 18, 13, 30%, you know, is this too much? Is it not enough? And it depends on your purpose. 
So if all you want to do is get a rough idea of your students vocabulary size to see if they're making progress, maybe this is fine. Maybe that much error doesn't matter very much. All you want is the big picture, a general idea. Okay, that's fine for that purpose. Okay. But let's say, what if you're teaching a really high level uh, class, maybe you're teaching doctors or diplomats, people who really, really need to have an excellent understanding of vocabulary. Well, then this test doesn't work, does it? Because there's way too much error. You know, these people with who are going to have important jobs, you know, it's giving them way too much vocabulary on the scores than they actually know. And that will cause them problems when they get in these jobs where vocabulary, excellent vocabulary is a requirement. So again, uh, the test comes down to the purpose. So the point here is we're looking at the vocabulary items and what we see here is multiple choice items have error here. And whether the error is too much or not depends on your purpose. But this is a limitation of every multiple choice item because students can guess if they don't know. And here's some charts just to kind of give you an indication. So on the vertical axis, there's the interview. The horizontal axis is the test. So if the test is really working well, all those dots, so all those dots are a person, should be right on the line, right? Where the test is giving exactly the same information as their interview scores. But what we can see is that's not the case. So underneath the line, the overestimation, that's where they're getting two highest scores on the test, where they're getting more scores than their real knowledge, which is the problem case, right? And you can see that, you know, that's where most of the people are, particularly the 9K Swedish people. Um, those students, you know, every one of virtually, well, we can see everyone except one, you can see the one little dot above the line, but every other person was below the line. So they were actually getting scores on the test that they didn't deserve. So the test was giving misleading information. Okay, and that's what happens with multiple choice tests. Okay, so I showed you, that's just one example of a uh, problem. So which format to use? So multiple choice has serious limitations. Which format is best to use? Well, let's actually run a research study. So my PhD student, Benjamin Kreml and I, well, it was his PhD research, so he did it, and I advise, and we published together. So we did, we had the same kind of thing. We had the interview, you see, at the top and the test item, and it was either matching or not matching, right? So exactly the same thing that I showed you before. Okay, and we used the vocabulary levels test. So this is the test that I wrote with my colleagues. So you can see it's a matching test. So for example, end or highest point, you would put uh, six, just write number six in there. And uh, that would be, you know, how that is, that, that's the match. That's how you take this test. Okay, um, multiple choice is like what we've seen here. So here's an example, Norbert's presentation is, so I hope that you believe that it's D, maybe, hopefully. If not, maybe you should like go do something more interesting than listening to the podcast. Okay, anyway, so that's multiple choice. And we also had form recall where students had to write. So this is a productive test. So a small dog with short legs and long ears used for hunting. And then we have the first letter and then we have the blanks. And the answer is, oops, let's go in the right direction here, beagle. Okay, so this is um, you know the productive test. So we got four different test styles, test formats we got the matching with the numbers, we got the multiple choice, A, B, C, or D, and we've got these two. So the first one just has a definition and the second one has a definition, but has a, just a small little sentence as well. Okay, what did we find? And what we found that is that the different formats behave differently. So there's a lot of numbers here, but I'll just point to this. So the, the two, the matching and the multiple choice, what we find is there's overestimation. Students are getting, higher scores than they should. They're getting scores for items that they don't know. And we got 22%, 20%. So in other words, almost a quarter, um, you know, they were getting those scores for free that they shouldn't be. Now, with the recall definition, so this is the production, 
they were actually underestimating. So in other words, the students were not getting the item correct, even though they knew it on the interview. And kind of the same thing here for the recall with the sentence. So what we find is the multiple choice uh, and the matching give students higher scores than they should get. But what we find is for, for the productive test, the students were getting lower scores than they should get. So like I say, no test is perfect. Now, another question is, what does the vocabulary test item show you? What information does it give you? So almost everything is about form meaning link. You know, does the student know the meaning of the word or can they spell the word? But, you know, quite often we see, you know, people saying, okay, here's a test, say a multiple choice test. And, ah, the students got it right on the test. Therefore, they know the word, know the word, or they learn the word, right? Well, that means like a lot of different knowledge. So what we did was we also gave a derivative back. Sorry about this. Here we go. We also gave a derivative knowledge. So we thought that, you know, here are words that students might see in their reading, inaccuracy, accurately, accuracies. Now, if they knew the base form, uh, maybe then they would be able to understand these different fo derivative forms. So what we asked them to do is write in the base form, the root form. So that would be accurate. Because if they knew accurate, you know, the question is, could they recognize these other derivative forms of accurate? And then for the collocation, it was just, keep doing that. Okay, um, aggressive behavior, antisocial behavior, ugly behavior. So tick two of those that are good collocations and the other one is not. So pick the two that um, are good collocations. Okay, so it's a derivative test, collocation test. And what we're interested in, if the students got these two right, did they get the test item right? Okay, and what we see here is, okay, for these, you know, the matching, the multiple choice, the two productive tests, basically about a third of the cases, the collocation, so this is for derivatives, for a third of the cases, the derivative knowledge did not match the result on the item. So in other words, the item did not really give, you know, two thirds of the time it gave good information, but a third of the time it didn't. The third of the time is too many, right? Who wants a test where a third of the time, you know, the test is giving the wrong results? So here we have collocation and we see it's even worse. So 48, 46, 38, 40%. So none of those test items really gave good information about collocation knowledge. So what's the punchline here? These four item formats all have underestimation or underestimation limits, and they don't really tell you about deeper vocabulary knowledge, like derivation or collocation knowledge. They can't really give you reliable and, um, yeah, where you can be confident in the scores about that deeper information. Um, so it's a limitation of these item formats. But you know, even though the item formats have these limitations, like I showed you, you know, usually you look at a result uh, in a journal and what do they say? Oh, the students got the score right on the test. Therefore, they learn the word or those words are known. But for me, that reporting is too vague. What we need to do is, um, you know, be able to say, OK, the students got this, these many words right on the test. That means they know how to use it in reading or they can tell you the meaning, you know, not just they know the word, that's way too vague. You know, knowing the word means you can use it anytime you want in any situation. Well, no test can show that. So we need to be much more precise about, you know, what do the scores mean? It's score interpretation again, right? Okay, a um, little bit about corpus test development. So we need to be careful about selecting our corpus to match the purpose of the test. Usually we've taken these big corpora and most of them are written and then we just use them to say, okay, here's vocabulary knowledge. But, you know, spoken corpora would be a lot better if you're going to make a test for listening. Or if you're going to do an EAP test, then you want to use an academic corpora. Or the sub t -lex test is a corpus of subtitles. That's why it's SUB. So subtitle 
Lexitas, or subtitle Lexis Corpus. So it's subtitle, radio TV subtitles. So if you're interested in whether your students can understand English movies or understand English television, that would be a lot better corpus to use. So we need to match our corpus with the test we're going to make and the purpose we're going to use it for. Okay, and you know, we need to be really careful about um, how we select our words. Now, I think, and I think most people now are agreeing that lemmas are probably best for L2 learners. Word families are, um, well, I don't think I have time to go. So lemmas are basically just the inflected form, the base and the inflected form. So it's like walk, walks, walking, walked. Okay, that's it. Word families use the other derivatives like walkable or walkability, I don't know. So word families are the bigger unit, but what we find is that L2 learners have trouble with derivatives. And so I think lemmas where you have the base form and just the grammatical inflections are a much better counting unit for L2, for almost all L2 learners, unless they're really, really proficient. Uh, for, prof for proficient users, proficient uh, L2 speakers and for native speakers, then families might be better. But I think for 95% of our purposes in second language teaching, lemmas are the way to go. Okay, what else do we talk about in our uh, paper? I think we had to, had to be really careful about taking old tests and revising them. So, I mean, the principle is okay, you take an old test and you revise it and make it better. But the problem is, you know, do we know, is the old test any good to start with? So not very many of these old tests have been validated. So you can't just assume that I'll take this test and it's fine, but I'll just update it. Um, you know, the test may not have been any good in the first place. <clears throat> so, I'm just saying, yeah, be, be careful. If you're going to revise an old test, you know, ask yourself, what validation was there of the original test? What did it do well? What didn't it do well? Or do we even know? And when you write a new test, say for example, for let's say you take the vocabulary size test and let's say you want to you know, change the translations from say Japanese into Thai. And now you've got a Thai version of the vocabulary size test. Well, you need to validate it for Thai students because you know, are Thai students the same as Japanese students? Some ways, yes, but some ways, no. So you've actually got to do your validation from scratch to see if it works in your new situation for your new students. But a lot of people don't do that. They just make new translations and then they put the test out there and it's like, oh, it'll work. All we did was like, we used the old test, it was fine and we'll just make the new language. But I don't think that that works. I think that we need to be careful we need to be careful about that and just make sure that it works in the new situation in the new country. Okay, uh, if test developers need to decide the level of mastery which will be measured. So again, are you going to just look at the form meaning link or do you want to see whether students know collocations? Do you want to see if students are able to use it in their own writing? Is it vocabulary that students need to uh, be able to understand when they read it? Is it just receptive? So you need to make your uh, level of mastery clear because again, the test only gives the numbers. For example, students got 50% right or students know the 2000 frequency words, but it doesn't tell you, you know, they're just numbers. It doesn't tell you what students can do with it. So you have to decide the level of mastery of the test and make that match your purpose and then report that so that your the people who are using your test can understand it. And we know it makes a difference because, let's see. Yeah, so down here at the bottom. Uh, so Bhatia Laufer and her colleagues, they had a four meaning link test and they had four different versions of it. So meaning recognition, form recognition, meaning recall, form recall. So receptive and productive. But you can see that out of 30 items, the average, the meaning recognition was the easiest form of the test. So the students got the highest scores on that, but form recognition was about the same. So these were multiple choice, but then that was a lot higher than the meaning recall where the students actually had to write down or say what the meaning of the word was. And the lowest score was the form recall where students actually had to spell out or pronounce the word. 
And what we're seeing here is that actually form is more difficult than meaning. In many cases, your students already know the meaning. They know what they want to say, but they don't know how to say it. That's the problem with L2 learning. So in many cases, form is more difficult than meaning. And the point here is that unless you specify what level your test is measuring at, how do we know what the scores mean? Because you got different scores. It's the same words here on these tests, but just different item formats are giving different scores for the same students. So that's a problem. So we need to be much more specific. Okay, um, don't launch a new test until you do this kind of validation that I'm talking about. Because one of the problems is you can't just say, I'll make the test, I'll put it on the internet and people will try it and we'll improve it later. Well, <laughs> we never do. You know, I wrote the vocabulary levels test with my colleagues in 2001 and people have done research and found some of the weaknesses and what needed to do improve it, but we never went back and revised it. You know, we're just on doing new things. So, you know, that's a problem. So I think you need to do the validation before you launch the test, before you make it available, not afterwards, because you just get busy and you never get around to it. And then students might be like, you know, taking the test and getting the wrong scores and actually, you know, harming them because, you know, they're being mismeasured. Okay. Um, what I think we should do, if we're going to you know, put a test out there, we should monitor tests and try to improve them if we necessary. No more publish and forget. Um, you know, let's see if the tests are working. And now where a lot of tests are now on the internet, we can actually collect data and actually see how the test is working and we can improve them. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, I tell, well, I used to tell my PhD students. So for example, Benjamin Kreml. So he wrote a vocabulary test. So we haven't quite launched it. We're gonna probably launch it next year. We need to do a little bit more validation before we launch it. But then, you know, I tell him, don't just, you know, put it out on the internet and say, it's fine. You know, keep looking at it and, you know, get data and, you know, try to improve it. Don't just publish and forget. So here's a little cartoon that kind of makes that point. Yes, do it, Benjamin, keep revising your test. You gotta keep revising it to make it better. Okay. Uh, one of the last points is, I think, with this idea of like, we need to show what the test does. How does it perform? What does the test mean? So I think we need, if you write a vocabulary test, you should you know, give a user's manual, how to use the test, but also how not to use the test. Part, one of the problems is we make tests and then people use them in ways that we don't even imagine that are, ra that are the wrong ways and actually giving really bad results. So, you know, we should tell, you know, how to use the test, what not to use it for, how to administer it, you know, is it the kind of thing you can put in a group, um, you know, or does it need to be one-to-one? -one? Can we use, do we need to use all the parts of the test and add them together? Or can we use parts of the test? Um, is there a time limit or not? Um, and from our research, what's the typical time? Teachers need to know like what's an average kind of time so that they can see whether it fits into the classroom or not. What kind of instructions should we give? How much help can the administrator give? Um, you know, okay, the answer key, you know, what are the answers and how should it be marked? And then this last one I think is, you know, the key thing I've been talking about, how to interpret the scores. What do the numbers mean? So turning it into what kind of science is meant, what does it mean the students can do in real life with their language ability? That's what we really want, score interpretation. Um, uh, and connect it with some kind of language use. Because in the end, you know, as language teachers, we're interested in four things, speaking, you know, the four skills, speaking, listening, writing, and reading. That's what we want our students to be able to do, right? And so I think probably almost every vocabulary test should be connected with that in some way. And then it'd be really, really useful to give information about like how a typical population of learners do, you know, how would people, you know, we've given this test before, how have people done on it? So we can compare your students to it. That's really, really helpful. Okay, so uh, that's my hour. So here's one last quiz for you. So this is the blank of the presentation. So is it A, B, C, or D? And if you're really good at vocabulary, I bet you'll answer C. There we go. Okay.
So that's the other presentation. I just want to highlight the website here at the bottom, www.norbertschmidt.co.uk. So this is my personal website. So even though I'm retiring from the university, I'm going to keep this up. And so it's going to, you know, it's going to be up for a long time still. And on this, what I've done is I put all of my publications, almost all of my publications. So all the journal articles, uh, book chapters, um, just different things that I've done. And they're all available for free download on PDFs or Word documents. There's also a section that's got um, vocabulary resources. There's vocabulary tests on there, information about corpora, um, different things for teachers. There's um, links to other people's website, for example, Paul Nation's website. So links to uh, other good vocabulary resources. So there's vocabulary resources. Um, there's also, if you're interested in learning more about me, you know, I do more than just vocabulary. So you can see pictures of me playing foosball with my family, me flying my little airplane, me playing guitar, uh, me traveling. So if you're interested in, you know, what I've been up to, uh, there's the personal site, but mainly, you know, there's the research there that you can download and the resources. And so I hope you find it really, really useful. It's freely available, tell you, you know, look at it yourself, tell your colleagues about it, uh, you know, have your students download any of the papers that you think would be useful for them to read uh, for their assignment. So it's there for free use. You know, I want people to use it. So the more, the better. Anyway, so that's the end of the presentation. Hopefully it's been interesting for you. You're all in different situations. So I can't tell you how to make a test for your situation. But what I can do is hopefully make you think about how you can do it better. Your value is you can take the ideas I presented, think about your situation, your students, your needs, and then you can make a vocabulary test for your situation that really makes sense. So if I've made you think, then hopefully this has been a successful presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Schmidt. Right, we have learned a lot about vocabulary measurement from you, right? And I think, you know, the audience is very happy to, uh, you know, watch you talking today. Right, so let's start the Q&A session, right? There are some questions in the chat box as well as in the question and answer. So let's start from the first one. What, okay. particular, what particular theory are we going to subscribe for test development? Any suggestions? Uh, okay, um, that's okay. It's a it's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, I don't. I'm not a believer that there's like one theory that basically you know is the one we should take. Because what are theories? All theories are are they're explanations, possible explanations of the way things work, right? The problem with language, it's so big that we can't get our head around it. We can't have like any theory that really captures everything about language. So I don't know if I can say like one theory that we should use. Now, what I would say is if you're going to, you know, really become interested in this and, you know, work with, you know, vocabulary testing, what you should do is you should read the testing literature, become familiar with different theories, you know, what has Messick got to say about it? What has Kane got to say? And basically, you know, think about it, but then think about it. Don't just, you know, believe everything like, oh, this is it. What you need to do is then use it with like a common sense approach and think, how does this connect to vocabulary learning? How does this connect with vocabulary teaching? So almost all the theories out there with testing have value. You know, they have some aspects that help us make better tests. But I think the best approach is really to look at different theories and see which of those tell us important stuff about how to make a good vocabulary test. But in the end, I mean, you know, I don't know if I'd call it theory or common sense, but for me, in the end, what matters is, you know, your specification, what do you want the test to do? What do you want it to show? And then how can you demonstrate, how can you 
you know, guarantee, there's no guarantee, but how can you try to ensure that the test you've made achieves your purpose? That's validation, that's theory. So really for me, it's, I'm, theory is important to inform you, but I, I would take a more hands-on approach. How can we, how can we make a validation procedure that shows the test does what it's supposed to do and that the test gives information that is useful for your own particular purpose. So I, I think that's the way I would answer that question. Okay, thank you very much, for, uh, Professor Schmidt. Right, let's move on to the second question. This one is about okay. collocations. Uh, it's been observed that um, learners produce different kinds of lexical errors. Okay. Yes. And some e some EFL learners tend to make more errors on arbitrary combination, whereas yeah. some do not. What theory can explain this situation about collocational errors? <laughs> no theory. No theory. <laughs> the answer. No theory. Um, that's one of the problems with voc voc vocabulary is that you know each each item is different, right? So, I mean, we, we tend to think about words, right? But vocabulary is more than just words, like this participant said, it's collocation, right? But collocations are different from each other. So some collocations are literal, like a sunny day is a sunny day, but it's still a collocation, right? The words go together. Whereas some collocations like uh, top shelf. So you like football in Thailand, right? So mm -hmm. like, oh, he was a great player. He scored a top shelf goal or a top drawer goal. Okay, top drawer just means excellent, right? So that collocation is figurative. It's almost like an idiom, right? So there's no theory that can explain why one person, you know, a particular person gets a particular collocation right or wrong. It's too, com it's more complex than that. Um, so that's why, you know, in terms of testing, it's like, instead of just saying, okay, we need a collocation test, maybe we need to even be more specific. Okay, maybe we need a test for call it literal collocations, one that you can understand, like sunny day. Why can't our students make that combination? The answer to that is probably different from why can't our students, you know, do the figurative collocation? With a figurative collocation, it's because they don't know the item. Top drawer is just like a lexical item, you know? It has mm -hmm. its own meaning. Okay, the reason they get it wrong is because they don't know it. But the literal collocation, sunny day, they probably know sunny, they probably know day. Why don't they put them together in the writing? Is it because they don't know it? Is it because they haven't, you know, noticed it before? You know, it's, it's probably a different kind of knowledge. And so it's again, this idea of theory, you know, the pro vocabulary is item based. And so it's really, really hard to think of a theory that can actually tell about all different kinds of items. You almost have to have a different explanation because that's what a theory is, right? Is that it's a possible explanation. Have a different kind of explanation for each kind of vocabulary type because idioms behave differently from collocations and individual words behave somewhat differently from uh, you know, lexical phrases. So there's all different kinds of vocabulary. If we just put them all together and say, let's have a vocabulary test. Well, it's never going to work, is it? Because there's different kinds of vocabulary. So um, I, I can't give an answer that like what, you know, what theory can like tell us why some students make these kind of errors and other errors. Now, yes, there's theories that can talk about individual cases, you know, and there's psycholinguistic theories and, you know, more than I can go into in this podcast. But yeah, it's just like, I think we just have to be, we have to realize vocabulary is complex. There's a big variety and we can't try to find an answer for everything in one theory. So I think that's what I'll say about that. Right, right, thank you very much. Uh, this is another question. How can we determine the choices in each item for a vocabulary test? Okay, so, so basically, I think the question is, how do we write good vocabulary items, multiple choice yeah. items, yeah? Okay, so here's some of my tips. 
again, it's just like, well, the first tip is, you know, you do it and then you trial that and you see what works and what doesn't work. But I think probably the easiest way is let's see some of the problems with multiple choice. Okay. So one of the problems with multiple choice is giving clues away. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the clues could be grammatical. Okay. So you might have like, okay. Uh, like a blank is an animal with four legs. Okay, so that's the, the item. And then you've got, you know, bear and cat and dog and uh, anteater. Now, it doesn't matter if the students know those animals or not, they can get the answer right because it's got to be anteater, right? Or no, let's see, if it's an, so I think I'm, it'd be easier to write it. But anyway, the point is, A-N, the next word has to be, start with a vowel, right? So that's a grammatical clue that could be uh, in your multiple choice. So you got to make sure you don't have grammatical clues. The other thing that people quite often do is like, uh, you know, you get the, the correct answer and then you try to think of four other ones. So if one answer is really much longer than others or much shorter than others, it's bound to be the right one. So students look for different lengths of uh, answer. And if there's one that's really different, that's probably the right answer. Um, I don't know, there's, it's almost like, okay, um, it's like I have to give like a course on like test writing, but I guess my short answer I, mean, I could talk half an hour on this, but probably the short answer is when you're writing the test, what you need to do is, you know, try to make sure there's no clues that gives the answer away. Then give it to a colleague, you know, have somebody else look at it. Because the problem is when you're writing a test, you can't see some of the problems. So one of the best things to do is just let somebody else take the test and see if they can catch it. And then if you're gonna you know, use the test and it's gonna be a higher stakes test and you're going to use you know, more than once, what you really need to do is trial it. You need to pilot the test, use it with a few students and see what you get. And sometimes what you find is, you know, I thought this was a good item, but everybody got it wrong. And then you look at it, it's like, oh, now I see what the problem is, mm -hmm. but you can't see it until you actually get some data. So, you know, I think my short answer just for the podcast is, you know, Try to make it the best you can. Look for the hidden clues. Give it to one or two other people. And if you possible, try to trial it. If it's a high stakes test, you need to do it, right? Because what I find with multiple choice tests is even if you're experienced like myself, you don't know how it's going to work until you try it. And that's one of the problems. People think multiple choice tests are easy. They're actually the most difficult item to write. And you just, you need to pilot them to see how they work because you just never know until you try it. So yeah, sorry, that doesn't give you like the full information, but I think if I'm going to take more than two or three questions, I think I right. probably should just stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the following question is like uh, from the same audience is, you know, uh, does it mean that the choices for vocabulary test uh, items should have the same length? You, you've got two possibilities. So either they should be about the same length because mm -hmm. then your students can't guess, right? Or if they're going to be different lengths, that's okay. But then in every item, make sure that A is the shortest, then B <laughs> is longer, then C, then D. Then there's right. no pattern, right? Mm. So what you try to do is avoid patterns, yeah? Mm. Now, one thing that one pattern that you get is like, okay, so you're writing a test, right? And so number one, what should it be? Okay, it's gonna be B. And number two, okay, let's see, I'll make it D. And number three, it's gonna be like A. So what's number four gonna be? <laughs> D, of course, right? Yeah. Don't do that. No, <laughs> no. The students will figure it out. So what I, I do is I get like a dice, a die, Oh. And then I roll it. Doodle, 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 two. Ah, oh, it's two. Okay, this one's B. Okay, number two. Ah, oh, it's two again. Okay, B again. That's okay, right? Doodle, doodle, five. Okay, that means roll again. One. Okay, that's A. 
So basically, you, or you can use cards, you know, ace, two, three, four, shuffle them up. Okay, what's this gonna be? Ace, okay, it's A. The point is make your answers random and that way, you know, the students can't find a pattern because you're not, there is no pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of tips to use with multiple choice items. Right, right, thank you. Uh, another quick question. Can you recommend any validation procedures to validate a vocabulary test? Um, well, I mean, the kind of things I'm talking about. So probably the first thing I'd say is have a look at the paper that this talk was based on because it gives a lot, you know, it gives more detail, you know, because when you write, you can give more detail than you can yeah. when you're speaking. So, you know, I'd suggest have a look at this paper and then um, have a look at, you mentioned my researching vocabulary uh -huh. book. Right. So that's, that's probably got the most detailed information on how to write vocabulary tests because vocabulary, vocabulary research is largely about measurement, isn't it? So in that book, I try to give a lot of tips about like how to, you know, write good tests and have good measurements. Um, so I think that would be a good resource. Um, Paul Nation, you know, also look on his website. He's got different publications. So he's got information on vocabulary validation and testing as well. Also like look at say, for example, my vocabulary levels test. So on my website, there's the article from 2001. So it's Schmidt, Schmidt and Clapham and look and see what we did about validation. You know, so see what other people have done. Um, again, just because I did it doesn't mean you have to do it, but it can give you an idea, right? Mm -hmm. In the end, what you have to do is think, you know, what can I do to show that my test works for my students and mm -hmm. my situation? Um, I really quite like interviews because you give the test, take the test away and interview them. And with interviews, you can really see, you know, if your students know the word or not, how well they know it. And then you can match it to the test results. And I think that's probably the best way of finding out how the test works because you've got a really, really good uh, baseline or criteria right. Right. to match the test results against. So I think that would be my kind of standard methodology for validation. Now, mm. you need more right. than that, but that tells you a lot. Mm. Right, thank you very much. Right, another one from, from a Thai uh, participant, your research okay. method using interview was quite interesting. It seems that if a multiple choice test is too hard, it overestimates the test taker's ability, right? The opposite is true for an easy multiple choice test. From your result of the 3K, 6K, and 9K test, mm -hmm. it seems that a difficult one, uh, namely the 9K is less valid than the easy test or 3K. Is this true? Can you elaborate? Okay. Um, so I think it, it's not less valid in mm -hmm. the sense, I think the reason why the scores were higher for the 9K is mm -hmm. because the students knew fewer words, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So that means they had more chances to guess, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the actual format is probably the same. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know the word, your chances of guessing are probably the same no matter what frequency it is. But at high frequency levels, you know, students might know, so the test had like 30 items. Okay, at the high frequency level, maybe you know 20 items, right? So you know them, you get them correct, but then you're only guessing on 10. Whereas for the 9K level, maybe you know five items, and so you're guessing on 25. Mm -hmm. So in ter the test item is the same, the validity is the same. The problem is, you know, if the students don't know the words, you know, no matter what, I mean, you get like a really, really super beginner taking the 3K, maybe they only know five words, right? So they'll have the same amount of guessing. So it's not the item format that's a problem. Well, it is the item format, but it also, like I'm saying, it depends on your participants, right? The participant matters. So for different participants, that have higher or lower proficiency, you might want a different item format, yeah? Right. So for a higher proficiency student, maybe you should go to like the productive test where you have to, you know, say what the word means or spell the word. 
I always like them better as well, because no matter what you have with multiple choice or matching, there's always going to be some guessing, right? Mm. In time, right. every student I've ever known, and me too, right? If I right. don't know it, I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance, right? Yeah, sure. Everybody does it. Yeah, right. And in right. fact, it's encouraged, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so any multiple choice or matching has that error. It's, you mm. know, you can't get away from it. Right. So if you really are interested in their true knowledge, I like the, the recall formats a lot better and okay a lot of people don't like translation oh translation is bad but actually for testing translation i think is better than multiple choice because let's think about it what we're interested the main vocabulary knowledge we're interested in is the form and the meaning link yes i mean collocation derivatives all that's also important but it all starts with the form meaning link so if you're reading or if you're listening you hear the form right it's already there. The form is already there. You don't need to produce the form. You just need to recognize it. Right. What you need to do is know that the meaning connects with it, right? So it's a form meaning link. Mm. Okay. So what's one of the best ways to find out if the students can recognize the form and know the meaning? Well, here's the form. Give the form, the L2 form, and ask them to give an L1 translation. So that shows that they understand the meaning, right? So actually that L1 translation is a really good way of seeing that form meaning link. Let's do the other way around. Okay, here's the meaning. You know the meaning in Thai, or you know the meaning in you know Spanish, uh, you know the meaning in Indonesian, whatever. What's the word in English? And that's the L2 problem, isn't it? We all know what we want to say in our first language. We don't know how to say it in the second language. So I think a translation where you actually, okay, here's your L1 translation, write down the word or say the word in the L2 is a very efficient way and a good way of just seeing, does that four meaning link match? Do they have that? Now, it doesn't mean they can use it in speaking. It doesn't mean they can write it down in a composition, but it does show whether they have that four meaning link, which is where everything starts. So, you know, I, I quite like those translation tests better than multiple choice, because if you don't know the word, how can you spell it? It's almost impossible, right? So those kind of translation tests are almost impossible to guess. And so if the students get it right, they probably know it. Okay, so I think, yeah. Right, so I, thank that, you. I think that's yeah. what I'd say on that. Right. We, we are running out of time, but, you know, okay. uh, uh, I have to apologize to the audience that, you know, we, we might not be able to, you know, answer all the questions, but I try to look at the different questions. Another one, uh, ah, this is something that should be useful. What, okay. uh, what are the current trends in vocabulary research? Yeah, what, what okay. would you suggest? Okay, so this isn't just testing, this is research in general. Yes. Okay, um, well, lucky for you. So go on my website and I've just published an article in language teaching that says, um, I've got like five or six ideas of where I think really useful research could happen. Mm. Um, so look on the website, but let me just talk about them. Okay, formulate language is a big thing. So, I mean, we know now that a lot of vocabulary is not just individual words, it's collocations, it's phrases, lexical bundles. And so continued research on sort of what we might say the bigger vocabulary, I think, you know, will continue to be really important and even more important. So understanding how language is largely phrasal, everyone thinks that like, oh, the sentence is the basis of English or, you know, language. And in, if you're a grammarian, yes, but actually most of the meaning is packaged in phrases. So formulate language is important. Mm -hmm. I think what, you know, looking at reception and production, um, most of the stuff that we, most of the materials we have basically are trying to teach that four meaning link usually to a receptive level so the students can understand it. But then there's a really big jump to where students can use it in their own speech or writing. 
So what I would like to see is some research that looks at different exercise types or methodologies or activities. What can we do to take the knowledge the students have? So receptive vocabulary. So they, they can understand that they can you know, get it right on a multiple choice test. So they do have that sort of initial receptive knowledge, but what can we do to help them be able to actually use it productively in their speaking and writing? Because that's the big jump, you know, what we see is it's, I think it's easier to go from no knowledge to receptive knowledge than it is from receptive knowledge to productive. I think receptive to productive is the bigger jump. So what I'd really like to see is what kind of activities, how much repetition do we need? You know, what does it take to help our students get to the productive level? Mm -hmm. Not from zero, but from the receptive level. Um, there's hardly anything on that, but I think as the teachers listening to this will agree, that's really important, right? Because almost all of us want our students to be able to use the vocabulary in speaking and writing. I mean, maybe some students just need to read. Okay, and that's fine, no problem. But for anybody who wants to use it in speaking and writing, how do we help our students make that jump? So that would be uh, one of my tips, like research right. I'd like to see. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank everybody you. out there, do some research thank on you. that. Thank Tell you. me what the right. That's is. interesting. Yeah, I think this should be the last one. How can we okay. just define only two options for a multiple choice question? I mean, the multiple choice question where there are only two items. How can we like, justify like, this? Like true, false, right? Maybe, right, maybe. Um, well, again, so what's your purpose? Um, you don't really see true false questions very often with vocabulary tests because number one, 50% chance of guessing. The only reason I could think that those would be useful is if you just wanted a very, very general idea of your students' vocabulary size, because the advantage of true false, every test had advantage and disadvantage, every format, right? The advantage of the true false format is that it's quick. So you can get more words on the test. And that's a good thing, right? But yeah, I, I don't really recommend, you know, true false or two option tests for vocabulary test. You know, again, if you're gonna to go to vocabulary, you know, probably just go away from multiple choice altogether. You know, go to a, you know, translation test, or if you don't like translation, okay, you know, write the definition in English or, you know, but, you know, translation, a good thing about translation is they're pretty quick as well, right? Because you should be able to write the translation pretty quickly or, you know, spell it pretty quickly um, in your L1. So you probably, they're probably just as fast and I think they give a lot better information. So how do you justify two option tests? Um, I, I wouldn't use them. So I don't know if you, you know, maybe there's a case, I'm not saying there's no case that, you know, they may be useful, but I don't think they're the best option for, for vocabulary. Okay, thank you very much, right? So okay. I think we are about to end the session. So on behalf okay. of Language Institute, Thomas Sub University, right, we are very grateful to your talk, Professor Dobber Schmidt, right, for sharing with us very interesting uh, useful ideas and suggestions in vocabulary testing, right? I, I believe that we have learned a lot from your talk today. And you know, uh, if anyone, any any audience, any participant would like to learn more from from Professor Norbert Schmidt's work, right? You can visit his homepage, right, where you can access uh, some. Uh, publications, right? Or maybe you can also look at his books and book chapters and journal articles, right? Mm -hmm. So after the session, right, uh, please, uh, you are going to be directed to the evaluation form, right? So thank you very much, Professor Norbert Schmidt, right? Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. I hope I made you all think, if we made yeah. you think, then it's been a good session. Thank you very much. You are a true gem for us. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.